Shalom, I'm Christine Darg, and welcome to our Exploits Ministry Center right in the heart of the old city of Jerusalem, which is very exciting and compact, noisy, and bustling, just the way I like it. We're right in the center of the world, ministering to the nations here inside historic Jaffa Gate and to all of the peoples of this region because we believe that God has sent us here as an end time minister of reconciliation. And on today's exploits program, I want to share with you some more insights into a topic that humanly speaking sounds almost impossible to fulfill. And that is, I'm going to be speaking on a genuine reconciliation that is predicted in the Bible between Jews and Arabs. And I believe that this is a major key to spiritual revival in the world. And the most amazing part of this is that you and I can have a role in this great end time reconciliation that will fulfill so much Bible prophecy because we are intercessors, because we are watchmen upon the walls of this old city of Jerusalem. The enmity between the Jewish people and the Arab nations began, of course, centuries ago in the tent of the patriarch of this region, the friend of God, Abraham. As the Bible account in the book of Genesis tells us, Abraham had a baby with his servant girl, Hagar. This is because he and his wife, Sarah, even though they were great patriarchs of faith, they had a temporary lapse of faith. And because they wanted children so much, they decided to take Hagar, the Egyptian maid, as a concubine and to have a child that way. But God had made a covenant promise with Abraham and his descendants. Who would inherit the covenant? The firstborn son, Ishmael, or the son of, Sarah's, of Abraham's wife, Sarah? Well, Abraham loved both sons. We know that Sarah did eventually have a son named Isaac. And God said he would establish his covenant with, uh, with Isaac. Nevertheless, God promised Abraham, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. And now that was even a play on words in Hebrew because the name Ishmael means God hears. And God said, behold, I will bless Ishmael. But Abraham's heart despaired for his beloved Ishmael. Every parent has a deep soul tie with his child or should have with his child, especially at a, non, at a young age. So Abraham's very soul cries out to God, Oh, Lord, let Ishmael be the one to live before you. Let Ishmael live. Now, interestingly, in Hebrew, that word here for live in the book of Genesis is hayah. This word means not just an earthly existence, just scraping by, it means living in prosperous health, prosperity, success. And ultimately we know Ishmael needs not just a wealthy, healthy, prosperous life in this world, he needs eternal life. What spiritual warfare at the very time when God is fulfilling his promise I believe in our day and age to his friend Abraham that truly Ishmael shall live, live, live. Satan, because he knows his time is short, has desperately inspired a culture of death, death, death. The daughters of Hagar are sending their sons and children off with bombs strapped to their bodies, becoming suicide bombers. Will we be brave and bold enough to tell the good news to Ishmael and his descendants how to receive eternal life. Since Ishmael means God hears, will Ishmael hear in this day and age through you? Will he hear through me? I believe in our ministry we're called to bring the good news to the descendants of all of Abraham, including Ishmael. Abraham accepted, interestingly, Sarah's decision, because it got to be a dysfunctional family, 
to cast out the maid Hagar and Ishmael. They were cast out into the desert, rejected, because God spoke to the patriarch, presumably in a dream, in which the Lord actually commanded Abraham to listen to his wife Sarah and ask Hagar and Hagar's son to leave. Now, if any of you men listening and watching don't, don't like that, the fact that God <laughs> told Abraham to listen to his wife, just check it out in Genesis chapter 21 and verse 12. God actually says to Abraham, listen to her and do what she says. Well, this unhappy threesome of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar came to an end when Sarah's fears demanded a showdown. She said, Isaac is going to be your one and only heir, Abraham. You see, this is always a problem in most families. Who is going to get the money? And who is going to be first in the will? So Hagar and Ishmael were thrown out into the Negev desert with very scant provisions. The account says in Genesis they were only given some bread and one animal skin filled with water. How humiliating was that? Not even a picnic basket and no mention of money. The Bible says they wandered. They were probably wandering in shock and disbelief at the cruel reality that had befallen them. I'm not a psychologist, but I can imagine that it was a terrible blow to Ishmael's young ego because he was at the impressionable bar mitzvah age to be rejected by his father. He was about 13 years old. The spirit of rejection that came upon him would have far-reaching consequences. Before long, the lad was dying of thirst, and his mother was literally wasting moisture through her tears. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord calls from heaven, and he shows Hagar a spring of water, and Ishmael's life is saved. Hallelujah. But the spirit of rejection nevertheless entered him, and it became like a generational curse, a curse that you and I can break through the power of the name of Jesus in these last days, because when we belong to the Lord, he gives us power. And he says, whatever we decree and command according to his will, it is done. And it is time for Ishmael to live and to be blessed. When we minister the living waters of the gospel to Ishmael, he will be satiated of his raging thirst, the thirst he had in the Negev desert and the thirst he has for salvation. Back in the year 1999, we were holding a seven-day ministry outreach in the ancient biblical city of Jericho. We were actually having a Jericho march, a seven-day march around the archaeological tell of Jericho. And the march was a parable to believe for the fall of the walls that are holding a billion souls captive in the house of Islam. And during that time, I had a vision from the Lord of Ishmael, and I saw him in this vision being rejected from Abraham's tent, and the sorrow that entered his heart when he was rejected by his father. You know, when a child is rejected, he is still thirsty and jealous for his parents' love. We believers in this generation, I believe, are destined by the Lord of the harvest to give Hagar and Ishmael those living waters and to reconcile them back to Father God so that they will never thirst again or be rejected and need the approval of their God because they will be accepted in the beloved, into the family of God through Messiah, Messiah. God will save the Muslims as you and I corporately fast and pray for them to receive a mass deliverance from the spirit of rejection for God, our God has the power to do it. I'm reminded of the lyrics of the popular song, El Shaddai, El Shaddai. Those lyrics refer to Hagar's sorrow. You know, as those lyrics go to that popular worship song, to the outcast on her knees, you were the God who really sees, and by your might you set your children free. 
How is God going to set his children free here in the Middle East? God always calls a Moses. He calls a Deborah. He raises up an Esther, an Apostle Paul, an Aquila, a Priscilla, teachers of the Lord's word. God sets the captives free through intercessors and through bold and fearless gospel messengers of the truth. Who would that be? In our day and age, it would be you, and it would be me by the grace of God. Yes, the lion of the tribe of Judah will soon lie down with the lamb, but there's also a wild donkey in the equation who needs to lie down with the lamb. And that wild donkey is Ishmael. It was prophesied in the book of Genesis that he would be a wild donkey of a man, but it is the Holy Spirit who will tame him as you and I preach the gospel. Ishmael's rejection engendered aggression. You see, it was the angel who prophesied to Hagar blessings, but it was the angel who announced that Ishmael will be like a wild, untamed donkey, and Islamic terrorism will be subdued when Ishmael, that wild donkey, is tamed by the Holy Spirit with lamb-like meekness to submit to Messiah Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and to the God of Israel, the real God. I hope we all know by now that the word Islam means literally submission. Submission to the principality of Allah. In Genesis, when Hagar fled from the cruelty of her mistress Sarah, the angel of the Lord actually instructed Hagar to return and to submit to Sarah. That was God's ideal. And although Hagar did initially obey, and she did return, it was only an outward submission. There was not an inward submission of heart. Hagar's insubordination of heart and Ishmael's mockery of his younger brother Isaac were their downfall. Nevertheless, God did promise Abraham that Ishmael would live and he would be blessed. So as you and I intercede decree and pray as bold deliverers in Zion, we will finally bring peace and healing to Ishmael. This submission of Ishmael that I'm speaking of to the God of Israel, I'm not believing it's going to be some sort of groveling humiliation at the feet of the Jewish descendants of his half-brother Isaac. I believe as you and I pray and fast, it's going to be a submission in spirit and in truth to the true God of Israel. You see, we see God's hand in Israel's rebirth, and we believe it is the Lord's purpose to restore the Jewish people in these last days to this land and to live at peace with their neighbors, the Arabs. And we heed God's clear warning that he promised to Abram in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. God said, I will bless those who bless you, Abraham, and I will curse him down to the individual who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But we must also not fail to contend for God to remember that he also promised Abraham to bless not just Israel, but Ishmael, and to bless him with life, eternal life. In Genesis chapter 16, although Hagar and her son were banished into a parching hot desert, God responds to their humiliation, and he assures Hagar that he will make Ishmael into a great nation. He will free them from oppression, and with the addition of that disturbing prophecy that he will be a wild donkey. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand will be against him, was the prophecy. You see, in a fallen world, wounded people tend to wound and hurt other people. But clearly, God's stated plan has been to bless Ishmael and to make him fruitful. But how shall the Lord bless anyone compared to a wild donkey? Isn't a wild donkey stubborn, unbroken, difficult to tame? The only solution for Ishmael is the same answer for every sinner. We're all rebels at heart. We all need to be born again, no matter what our national background. And by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, just as I'm tamed, I'm, I'm brought to be a mature believer, so Ishmael must be tamed like the gentle colt on which Jesus rode into Jerusalem before the 
Passover festival on Palm Sunday. Here is a lesson of consolation that we all have to learn. I've learned it in my life, and I believe it's one of the lessons of the life of this dysfunctional family of Abraham's, which became the family of faith. Although Isaac was chosen to be the son of promise, God still cared deeply about Ishmael, and he lavished compassion on him, even when Abraham and Sarah did not. This is a lesson all of us will learn sooner or later. We should never count on the arm of flesh any human being to console us, even when we're hoping for consolations and, and uh, a kind word, even from a very close relative. Sometimes because they're finite human beings, they cannot meet our needs. They even disappoint us. Only the Lord ultimately is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. How many of us have learned that bitter lesson? Ishmael and Hagar learned it, and they learned in the desert to lean on the arm of the Lord, who has promised never to leave us or forsake us. We have now entered the time, in end time history, when God plans, hallelujah, to fulfill his promise to Abraham that Ishmael might live and be a great nation, not just with oil wealth. For what would it profit the Arabs if they gain all the oil wealth of the world, yet still forfeit their souls. This is where you and I enter the scene as deliverers. Isaiah chapter 59 declares, if you extend your soul to the hungry, and in Ishmael's case, he's not just hungry, he's thirsty until he finds Messiah. And if you satisfy the afflicted soul, the Arabs are afflicted like slaves in a religious, economic, and social system. If you do these things, God says, then your light shall dawn in the darkness. And the Lord says he will guide us continually and satisfy our soul in drought. And we shall be called the repairers of the breach. You and I are called prophetically to repair the separation between Isaac and Ishmael, between the Jews and the Arabs. In my years of ministry here, I have watched wonderful steps and progressions in the building and the binding up of wounds between believing Jews and Arabs. Many believers are beginning to see the bigger picture, yet there's still a long way to go to break the cycle of hatred, rejection, suspicion, hurt, murder, retaliation, and withdrawal from one another. Ultimately, the animosity and perpetual enmity can only be broken through the cross of Jesus and the binding together of the one new man as the dividing wall of enmity between Arab and Jew falls. The cross of Messiah shatters the hatred and animosity because we, we all become indebted to the same Savior and therefore submitted to the same Lord. As a matter of fact, from a biblical point of view, it is forbidden for Israelis and Arabs to resent their coexistence in this land. The Torah commands Israel to embrace the stranger who dwells in the land and to live together according to the law of the Lord. In my preparations, I have found seven fascinating parallels between the Ishmael and Isaac accounts in Genesis chapters 21 and 22. This tells us that the Bible is concerned for the welfare and blessing of both of Abraham's sons. He's concerned with blessing both Ishmael and Isaac. But because God made an everlasting covenant with Isaac and his descendants, Judaism and Christianity have, of course, emphasized the Isaac account in Genesis chapter 22. After all, Isaac climbing Mount Moriah in Genesis chapter 2 with the sacrificial wood on his back is the type of Christ who obediently submitted to death on the wooden altar of the cross also on Mount Moriah. The Ishmael account however in Genesis chapter 21 has been de-emphasized but to get the bigger picture we must not miss this. The book of Genesis, the foundational book of the Bible carefully recorded for a great purpose the promises God made to Abraham's other son, Ishmael. So here are the parallels. Parallel number one. In Genesis chapter 21, Abraham is asked by Sarah to forsake his firstborn son, Ishmael. 
But in Genesis chapter 22, God asked Abraham also to sacrifice the son of promise, Isaac. Parallel number two, in both heart-wrenching instances, Abraham obeys. Not only does he forsake his firstborn Ishmael in Genesis chapter 21, he also decides to forfeit Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. Parallel number three. In both accounts, Abraham does not procrastinate, but he rises early in the morning to carry out these sad commands. Number four, in both accounts, Abraham realizes that his obedience will seal the fate of both of his sons. How does he bring himself to obey? I believe he did it by entrusting the lives of both of his sons into God's providence. Parallel number five. In the Ishmael account in Genesis 21, God heard Ishmael crying. Ishmael's heart is broken from rejection, but he also cries for thirst. In Genesis chapter 22, as Isaac carries the wood up the mountain, he cries out, where is the lamb? Both accounts are gospel types. Both sons need living water, and both sons need the substitution, the sacrificial lamb of God. Parallel number six, Abraham answers Isaac, the Lord who sees will provide the sacrifice. That is the same heart attitude that Abraham must have experienced when he turned his back on Ishmael. Abraham no doubt said to himself, Concerning Ishmael, in Genesis chapter 21, the Lord who sees him will provide, not only for Ishmael, but for Hagar. For in fact, it's so interesting to me, Ishmael's mother Hagar testifies at the spring of life-giving water in the desert. She says, you are a God who sees. And so the well was named literally, well of the living one who sees me. This is the same um, Hebrew word for Yehovah Yireh, the Lord who provides, the Lord who sees. The one who in Genesis 22, who provided the sacrificial ram. And finally, the seventh parallel, in both stories, God's angel intervenes to save the lives of both sons. So therefore, I want to emphasize God is concerned for both sons. Say amen. Now the comparison is not perfect, but Ishmael reminds me of the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, which is sometimes called the parable of the lost son. Ishmael was lost out in the desert, but he's finally coming home to the Father in these last days. And God is running out to him along the road with divine dreams and visions as the Spirit is being outpoured in the Islamic world. In my book, The Jesus Visions, I have recorded countless true stories of Muslims meeting Jesus on the road. And in many of the lands where Ishmael's physical and spiritual descendants live, the gospel is blocked but the Holy Spirit passes through walls and across national borders in dreams and visions in the nighttime. The Father God is throwing his arms of unconditional love around Ishmael's neck. He's bringing Ishmael home right back into the bosom of Father Abraham. God is putting a gospel robe of righteousness on Ishmael's shoulders. He's putting gospel shoes on his feet and a signet ring of love on his hand and giving him gospel authority when he believes in Jesus. There is dancing and merriment in the desert of Islam whenever Ishmael's descendants come home to Father God by believing in Messiah, Jesus, because they are receiving the love that they crave, finally. They're receiving God as Father. Now, when you hear the doleful cries from the minarets in the mosques, Please don't shrink from that cry. Please don't be afraid of the Muslims, but respond to the cries of the lost in the house of Ishmael. Let none of us be like that unhappy elder brother in the parable of the lost son. Because God the Father says, this my son Ishmael was dead, but he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. 
To most believers, Hagar and Ishmael are perceived as outsiders, yet God sees the bigger picture. He appeared to Hagar, he protected her child, and likewise again, God is moving now outside of the church. He's freely appearing to the Muslims in Revelation, and he is revealing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. These Jesus visions in the Islamic world are outside of the box to our finite minds, but in fact, the prophet Joel predicted that in the last days, the Spirit of God will be poured out indiscriminately on all flesh. Therefore, we must enlarge our hearts. God's concern goes beyond the boundaries of the people of God. At this moment in time in history, God is demonstrating his love for the Muslims by repeatedly appearing to many of Ishmael's descendants through dreams and visions, and sometimes to entire groups all at once, saving them as the Holy Spirit is being poured out all throughout the Islamic world. I tell you, it is a joy to see this happening. These miracles among Muslims are happening, and I want to encourage you if you have been just amazed to know that God is appearing to Muslims through dreams and visions, I want to encourage you to visit our website at www.exploits.tv. In my years of travel throughout the Islamic world, I've had the opportunity to hear many first-hand accounts, which I've written in my book, from Muslims who have had a supernatural encounter with Jesus. The Lord is appearing to them. And you can read about this and share these stories, not only with people, perhaps in your family, in your churches, but with your Muslim friends. I'd also like to remind you that our ministry magazine called Exploits is available free to you. And you can read about it at our, ex at our exploits.tv website, or you can email me. You can stay in contact with me at our email address, which is info at exploits.tv. And we'll be very glad to send you a free copy of this magazine. And you can also learn about our conferences and other activities that we hold here in the Holy Land. So until next time, I want to encourage you to be strong and to do exploits for God, to pray for divine reconciliation between Jews and Arabs. I'm Christine Darg from our Exploits Ministry Center saying, Shalom, Shalom.